When making sourdough bread, everyone always tells you that kneading is essential. People are claiming don't knead for more than 10 minutes because that could be bad for your dough. Now, is that actually true? That's what I want to test and show you in this video. Now, I have not been the first one to try this. There's a great video by Baking with Jack. And he's been trying to hand knead a dough for more than one hour and a half. And he couldn't see a significant difference. Kudos for him for trying that. That must have been quite an awesome workout. Now, I want to take it to the extreme. I want to test this one more time, but using the power of 1000 watts of engineering. I'm going to be using my stand mixer and I'm going to be kneading the dough like it has never been kneaded before. So we're going to knead, knead, knead and do a little bit more of kneading. And then hopefully we can see a difference. So let's test this and I can tell you, you'll be surprised by the results. There are a lot of great learnings incoming. So let's quickly talk about why you should knead. Very important for your dough is the gluten network. And by default, your gluten network is not aligned. The gluten network is essential because that traps all the gas that's produced during the fermentation, which is when bacteria and yeast are converting your dough into something super delicious. Your dough won't hold together as much. Your dough is much more extensible. It's not as elastic. This also means if you are troubled with flatbread, then it might be that you're not creating enough dough strength. You're not developing your gluten network well enough. And that's exactly what kneading is doing. Imagine it like this. After kneading, you have nicely aligned your gluten strands. Your dough can entrap all that air much better and you'll also have a dough that rises a lot more in the oven. Now, you don't always have to knead. This depends on the flour that you're using. There are pretty much two categories. There's the gluten-based flour, which has a lot of gluten. That would be wheat or modern spelt. And then there's the category of flours which doesn't have as much gluten rye, emmer, iron corn, or gluten-free flour. For this category, you pretty much just have to homogenize, mix together the ingredients. There's no need for any kneading. For wheat and modern spelt, however, you have to knead. You have to develop that gluten network. And of course, there's one exception to the rule. You might have seen recipes being labeled as no knead. And yes, there really are no knead wheat recipes. However, what they're doing is they're lowering the amount of water that you're using for your flour. And then they're using the effect of the so-called autolysis. By just mixing flour and water, over time, your dough is going to homogenize. And that's already aligning the gluten strands. That's why when kneading by hands, it's always recommended that you do a set of kneading, wait five minutes, and then go at it again. But if you want to have that crisp crust on your sourdough, paired with a somewhat moist, fluffy crumb texture, then you have to go high in hydration. You need to up your water game. And that's when you have to knead. If you don't knead, you'll just have a very flat pancake. Dough strength is really essential. If you're kneading by hand, then I definitely recommend you to check out my five tips to create incredible dough strength. That's really going to step up your dough strength game. I made two times exactly the same dough. That's 400 grams of bread flour, 320 grams of water equaling 80% in terms of baker's math, 40 grams of sourdough starter. I was using my liquid starter, but in case you wanted to use a regular starter, that would totally be possible. I would recommend you to bump this up to 20%, but in my case for my liquid starter, as it increases the hydration of the final dough quite a lot, 10% is a good value, that's 40 grams. And then there's another eight grams of salt, which is 2% in terms of Baker's math. And now I so happen to have exactly the same stand mixer because one was undergoing repairs and it was just recently sent back, which is cool because yeah, then I have the same setup for kneading. I like to knead with a stand mixer until I see that the dough lets go of the bowl. That sometimes takes around 15 minutes. So that's quite a lot of time. Now, whenever this dough is done, I'm going to be doubling the kneading time on this dough. So let's say this takes 15 minutes, then I'm gonna be putting a timer for an additional 15 minutes on this dough. So it's gonna be a lot of kneading. Let's get to it. Okay, I'm gonna start on setting three for around five minutes. This just makes sure that everything is nicely homogenized. <laughs> So after around five minutes of kneading, I would more call this homogenizing the dough, mixing everything together. Just let this sit for another 10 to 15 minutes. It's going to make the whole process so much easier because now the flour has to absorb all the water. So if you're kneading by hand, 
do the same thing. You don't want to knead now, it would just be in vain. Just allow your flour to soak up the water and then it's so much simpler. Since this dough is so high in hydration, I'm not going to cover this. I will just let this sit at room temperature open like this for a little bit. So let's do the second batch of kneading on medium high speed for 10 minutes. <laughs> Around 10 minutes later and the dough still won't let go of the stand mixer. I'm gonna be doing another five minute break and then we'll be back. So third batch of kneading, another 10 minutes at medium speed. Okay, and let's do the last set of kneading, this time on high speed for another 10 minutes until I see that the dough really lets go of the ball. So the dough lets go of the ball, this means we are ready. I need to add maybe a voice over here. So you saw the dough really nicely let go of the bowl. So the dough is done kneading. We have great gluten development. But now I'm just gonna continue kneading at the same speed for another, I wanted to do another 30 minutes probably, but I think that's too much. I'm just gonna be doing another 10 minutes that should also visualize what's going to happen. Super interesting. And now check this out. After another 10 minutes of kneading, this is the consistency <laughs> of the dough. So it seems like there's still a little bit of, <laughs> of a gluten at work, but yeah, it also doesn't hold together as much. I'm wondering whether that's because we just knead it and there's it's now warmer the dough. So I'm just gonna be letting this sit for a little bit and then uh, let's check back. Today, I wanna test whether it's possible that you need too much. Needing too little is definitely possible, but needing too much, is that a thing? So I'm going to be extracting a small sample like I always do from both the doughs. And I want to make sure that they are also equal in weight, just so that we can compare this. The second dough, the one that we needed for so long, it actually now has a little bit of a better gluten network. It still feels a little bit sticky, but Let's also now extract our fermentation sample from this one. Okay, the two samples have been extracted. The regular one, which didn't have excessive kneading, and then the one which I needed a lot more. Those are the two doughs next to each other. Um, let's give them one stretch and fold. Good consistency here on this dough. It looks a little bit messy right now because I had to take a picture. <laughs> the picture for the video. But overall, I'm just rounding this up now. I think this dough feels really nice. This is how you wanna start into the bulk fermentation with a nice smooth dough ball. And now the other one, after kneading, it was a little bit strange. I could just tear it, but maybe that has also been the increased heat that we applied to the dough through that kneading. But now it feels now it feels okay. You see that? It looks okay. I, I couldn't necessarily note a difference now in terms of how the dough feels. I'm also just going to be rounding this up now. Oops. And this only works because there's no flour inside of the pot. What I notice here on this one is that it holds together a little bit more. This one seems to be a little bit more extensible. So here the gluten network seems to have developed more. Interestingly, there are a few more pockets, tiny pockets of air here. And I'm thinking that's because we kickstarted the fermentation by just increasing the temperature so much. And of course, at a higher temperature, the yeast is also fermenting faster, well, the bacteria as well. So that's also an issue we now have with the sample jar because 
This dough now is of course hotter than this. The sample jar will cool down faster than the ambient temperature. So this sample jar is not so reliable in this situation. In this case, a pH meter is a little bit more reliable because then we can just measure this dough directly. Or if we had a large container, which we mark the dough expansion on, then that would make it simpler as well. Anyways, I'm just going to let this sit now and every two or three hours, I'm going to be giving this a stretch and fold because I have time. If you don't have time for stretch and folds, nothing to worry. Just try to give it one before you shape it. So it's around three hours later. Let's do our first stretch and fold. One thing that I notice is that this still flattened out a little bit more than this, but not so much actually. That might be also because it has been hotter at the start. Let's check though for the consistency. Do I note a difference? The dough that we needed for a very long time, this one here, and it feels like every regular dough. I wish I could tell you it feels completely different, but it does not. So nothing out of the ordinary. The next dough, the dough, that has not been needed as much. Hmm, interesting. It feels a little more extensible. And you see that also when I lift it, it doesn't let go of the container as much. So it sticks a little more. Now, if I'm seeing this, I have a feeling that this dough here is flattening out a little bit faster than the dough that we needed for a longer period of time. So let's see again in a couple of hours which dough actually flattened out more. See you. So the two doughs, there is not that much of a difference. Despite the right hand one, which I needed for way more, so this one was needed for way more, has also increased in size a little more than the left hand one. Looking at the two dough samples here, the normal one hasn't increased as much as the needed one. And I think that's because the needed one just was so much higher in temperature than the normal one. Now what happened to me before, when I was using whole wheat flour and I needed for too long, that this line here, the dough didn't move at all. It just stayed on that line. But this is something that I can't reproduce and I've never needed a dough as much as I did this one today. So I find that super interesting. I'm gonna be setting up another dough just with my whole wheat flour because I wanna prove that point to you. But let's continue watching this and see if there's going to be a difference. We just have to be a little bit worried now. This is also a good thing to learn because the temperature of the dough and the room temperature was different. And that means that our sample is not as reliable as it could be. That's because, for instance, our sample, it might have been hotter than room temperature at the start, but then it cools down way faster than the main dough. So the fermentation of this dough is even faster than it is for this sample. And this almost doubled in size, so we have to be very, very careful. And just by looking at this dough, I would say that it's very close to finishing the fermentation. So two things. Let's give both of those an additional stretch and fold. And then I'm setting up another whole wheat dough where I will be repeating the same thing, giving it a lot of kneading. So this is the dough which we haven't needed, which we have net <laughs> needed for as long. And it feels that this one is a little bit more extensible than the one that we needed for a longer period of time. That's the only difference that I note. This one feels stiffer than the left hand one. So the one which we needed less feels more fragile than the one which received more kneading love. So needed more, needed less. Around the same pH. And wow, look at this, the pH is lower. That's super fascinating. So, I mean, this shouldn't be part of this experiment, but interestingly, it seems that the one which has a bigger volume increase, the one which we needed more, it was warmer. 
it seems that the warm temperature contributed to a bigger volume increase, whereas the pH is almost on the same level. Even on the right hand side, the one which we needed more, here it's a little bit higher than on the one which we needed less, which started into the bulk fermentation at a lower temperature. This is an interesting idea for a future experiment, just testing the different fermentation speeds and seeing what happens, which one is more sour than the other one. Anyways, I'm now going to be shaping both of them. I'm not gonna be throwing this away. This will go into my discard starter jar and um, then they'll start proofing. So both of the doughs finished shaping. The one which we needed for more, the one which we needed for less. And one thing I think is super interesting, both have around the same pH, but the one which we needed for longer has increased more in size. I think that must have been the change in temperature. From a pH perspective though, I would say that both of them are ready. Although this one here hasn't doubled in size before. So that's something, something is odd. We need to investigate a little bit more. But both of the doughs felt good when shaping. I couldn't say that the one that we needed for more, for way more, was worse or was better in terms of shaping. Both of them were easy to shape. I didn't have any issues. So here now for shaping and for the consistency, we don't have a clear winner. I'm wondering whether there's going to be a difference when we bake both of them tomorrow. Since it's already relatively late here in the Germany, I am going to be storing them in the fridge, then I'll bake them tomorrow morning. So that's gonna be around eight to 10 hours in the fridge probably. See you. And voila, good morning. Here are the two those, the one which we needed for more and the one which we needed less. And you can see directly how this one here is just a little bit more fluffy than the left hand one. Just to make sure we have an equal comparison, I will be baking both of them on my stone. I'm sprinkling a little bit of semolina flour that just makes sure that they don't stick. Use a little bit more than too little. So let's score them and bake them. So if you have a Dutch oven, you could also be using a Dutch oven, but the stone totally works. I did a nice comparison on both of the options and there wasn't a clear winner, please do check out that video, which I will be linking right here. Great, interesting experiment. So let's load them now. For baking, I'm just using upper bottom heat and then 230 degrees Celsius. Don't go too hot, don't go too cold. That seems to be the sweet spot. So I'm gonna be baking with steam for 25 minutes. Then I'll remove the steam to finish the crust. I will show you the final bread. I'm super curious to see how they look like. So let's start with the one that we didn't need as much. I'll reserve the good one for last. Mm. <laughs> Perfect looking grump. Wow. So nice and airy, not too wild. Perfect bread right here. I'm so excited to test this. By the way, has any one of you ever sliced the bread like that? <laughs> so, dough number two, the one which we needed for additional time. The ear is too big.
<laughs> Look at this fluffiness. Wow. <laughs> this is amazing. So um, I wish this experiment would have confirmed it that you can knead too much. But for this style of dough, which had around 90% hydration, if I recap this correctly, we can't. We just made the perfect sourdough and I had hoped this was going to fail. So we'll repeat this one more time with a whole wheat dough. And we need to talk one more time about heat and gluten development. But first, let me make that whole wheat dough now. So my whole wheat dough, this had great consistency but now after kneading for the same amount of time, this just turned into this blubber. But the same thing happened yesterday with the other dough. I just had to let it sit at room temperature and then it became good again. I'm gonna be putting this into my bulk fermentation container. I already extracted the sample. And then let's see if this comes together again. Hello again, around six hours later. Our dough sample hasn't increased that much in size, but the leaky gluten network came together a little bit better. So it's uh, much better than it was before now. Good consistency for dough since it's already 10 p.m. now. Yes, six hours. <laughs> since it's already 10 p.m. now, I'm going to bed. I'm just gonna let this sit overnight and check back tomorrow morning. See you. Good morning, check this out. This dough just exploded overnight and the sample also now more than doubled in size. This dough looks way <laughs> over fermented now. Do you see that? The gluten can no longer hold the structure. And the dough starts to collapse. You see how the dough here just falls apart? Yep, this dough is definitely over fermented. The only thing I can do now is I can use a loaf pan, toss this into a loaf pan and then just wait another 30 minutes or so and then bake it. So it seems the over kneading, the dough came together and then it continued to ferment as usual. Still, I wasn't able to confirm what I wanted to show you. So let's go back to the whiteboard one more time. So I think what I noticed as over kneading here was actually not over kneading, but it was just me heating up the dough way too much. And that happens when you mix with your stand mixer. With every movement of your dough against the bowl, you are creating heat. So at the start, our gluten network wasn't aligned. Then it was aligned. And then with the heat, we somewhat damaged it. But then after just letting it sit, it magically aligned again. And I mean, that was confirmed with the white bread that I was baking. It was one of my best sourdoughs that I ever made. And it had been kneaded for a very, very long period of time. So we need to repeat this one last time. The third time is the charm, like they say, right? And now we need to make sure that we don't overheat the dough while kneading. And I'm hoping that finally then we are able to see a difference. So next try. This time I made the dough a little bit stiffer. Overall it has around 80% hydration. Plus I used cool water to make sure that the dough is not heating up as much during the kneading process with the stand mixer. I'm hoping that that's gonna help. Plus I'll be doing more intervals. So I'll be kneading for around 10 minutes, then 10 minutes cool down, another 10 minutes of kneading, 10 minutes cool down and so on. This way I wanna make sure that the dough just doesn't heat up as much. So let's build some dough strength again. I don't know if I ever needed a dough so much. This has been kneaded for around an hour with always small intervals, 10 minutes kneading, 10 minutes off, 10 minutes kneading and so on. And just check out the dough consistency. It feels like every regular dough that I have been making. Just this time, I really try to make sure that the dough wouldn't overheat. And yeah, the dough really nicely holds together. I'm going to be extracting my sample again. 
and then I will be putting this into a new container. It's gonna sit in there overnight. So I'm using my overnight sourdough recipe in this case. So let's round this up, extract the fermentation sample, and then we're gonna be back in the morning. So far, it looks like every other regular dough. And I'm really hoping that I'm able to reproduce my issue that I had before, where the dough just wouldn't expand because the gluten network was too stiff. Let's see if we can. Just playing a little bit with the dough, I'm rounding it up and it feels like a normal, regular dough from the consistency, not too stiff. You can see it nicely holds its shape. That's always a good sign of good dough strength development. But nothing is out of the ordinary here. The dough is now ready to go to bed, just like I am. It's getting very late. We Germans go to bed early. I extracted the small dough sample here. And um, what I hoped to happen, what I had happened before, is that this wouldn't increase in size, the sample, and neither would the dough. And then I touched the dough and the dough just became super, super, super sticky. So that's what I'm hoping to be able to reproduce. Let's check again tomorrow morning. Definitely, I would say over kneading, even with a machine, <laughs> is very hard as far as I can tell. But uh, let's see if we can reproduce this. See you. Bye bye. Good morning again. Here's our dough. I already gave it a stretch and fold around an hour ago. And this is our sample. And what I note on the sample is it has increased in size still quite a lot. I expected it to increase less in size, but I'm not able to reproduce this anymore. I would say though that overall we have been fermenting since it's now around lunchtime for well, maybe 14 hours, which is quite a lot. And for that, the size increase isn't so large. What I wanna do now is I wanna check my pH meter uh, to check how much acidity we actually have inside of this dough. And the dough is at around a pH of four-ish. So it's very, 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 very close to over-fermentation, I would say. So that's interesting because just based on the sample, I can't say that the sample hasn't increased as much, but this dough now says Yep, I'm very close to over-fermentation. And this means that by kneading too much, our sample here has become a little bit less reliable and we are now running into the danger of receiving a very, very, very sticky dough. I'm gonna shape this anyways, and then let's try to bake this. And here we go with our shape dough. What I notice is that it just hasn't increased as much in size as it would normally do. And I think that's because our dough is so stiff from a gluten network perspective. But is this now a difference where I would say this dough has turned bad? I don't know. I would say that it's still okay. It's a little bit different, that's for sure, but it's not that much worse. Since this is already very close to over fermentation, I'm gonna be placing this directly in my cold fridge. I don't have time to bake this now, so I'm going to be baking this tomorrow. What I could also do is I could just leave it here to proof until the finger poke test passes, and then I bake it directly. I would probably put it into the freezer just to make scoring a little bit easier around 30 minutes before the bake, but I'm not gonna do that now. I'll bake that tomorrow. That totally works. Method that you're using now, depends on your schedule. So see you again tomorrow. And voila, here is the final bread. I just finished baking it and it's a little bit tinier than what my breads typically are, but still it got really nice oven spring, even a little bit of a double ear. So this dough definitely had a lot of strength. Let's cut this open and check out if we can see something on the crumb structure. And voila, the crumb structure. I wouldn't say that I can see something super obvious here. I mean, the pockets of air are not as big typically as they are for me, but this crumb looks great. Also, when I touch it, the consistency here, it's not off. 
it looks like a regular bread. So let's jump to the whiteboard one more time and draw a conclusion. So can you knead too much? Nope. Simple answer, you can't knead too much. The only thing you can do is you can heat up your dough for way too much and then it starts to degrade a little bit. But afterwards, I've seen the dough comes together back again. But if you knead for a very long period of time, then imagine your dough. It's almost like a car tire. It's very, very hard to inflate. And that's what I've seen in the last experiment, in the last video. It took very long for the sample that I extracted to increase in size. So in that case, I would have over fermented my dough. I wasn't able to rely so much on the sample because simply it didn't increase in size. That's because we had built the car tire dough. It didn't want to be inflated as much. The dough was way too elastic, it held together too much. And in that case, a pH meter is going to help you. Because with a pH meter, you can judge the dough's readiness without looking at the size increase. You could of course also use your nose. So if you need for a very, very long period of time, it's harder to spot whether your dough is done or not. Which I think is interesting for a large bakery. You have to be careful to not knead your dough for too much in a stand mixer. You wanna make sure that you knead your dough exactly the same time every time. That way you make sure that you have a reproducible process. One thing that you will also notice on a dough that has been kneaded too much is that you won't have such a super fluffy open crumb. So if you're a chaser of that, then make sure that your dough is very nice and extensible. You need to find the perfect balance between not kneading too much and just kneading the right amount. Definitely a super interesting eye-opening experiment if you ask me. Or maybe that's just because I'm just geeking out way too much about sourdough. I just find it super fascinating. So if you see somebody saying you can knead too much, please point them to this video. Thank you very much for watching. As always, may the gluten be with you and happy baking. Bye.